In the wake of his brother's abdication, King George VI became king on May the 12th, 1937. This meant that his young daughter, Elizabeth, who was just 11 years old at the time, would one day succeed him as queen. George VI, when he was a younger man, was devoted to his, his wife Elizabeth, the, the queen, and to their children, Elizabeth and Margaret. He was not somebody who was seeking the limelight. He was not somebody who wanted to have his, his name up in lights. He was somebody who would have much preferred a quiet, simple family life. If you're the heir to the monarch, there's always a sense of preparation to become a king or queen. And from the moment Bertie became king, Elizabeth was queen in training. Two years later, World War II broke out. Princess Elizabeth was only 13 years of age when the outbreak of war occurred on September the 3rd, 1939. The influence of her surroundings and the very nature of her family shaped her into becoming the longest reigning monarch in all of British history. This is A Princess at War. King George VI had two daughters, Princess Elizabeth, born in 1926, and Princess Margaret, born in 1930. Albert adored his two girls from the very beginning. While Margaret is said to be a bit more rambunctious, young Elizabeth, who was called Lilibet at the time by those closest to her, is said to have been very well behaved and serious beyond her years. King George VI, he always referred to his, himself, his wife, and two daughters as us four. Us four, they were a, a wonderfully tight unit. They never anticipated their ranks and their position and their responsibilities changing. They anticipated carrying on as being this very close-knit, very loving us four. Princess Margaret and her sister did have hugely enjoyable and very loving childhood. George's relationship with his uh, daughters is a very good one. He had a deep affection for both Elizabeth and Margaret. He was a family-orientated man who took great pleasure in watching them grow up and ensuring their development. He also saw them as the future of the monarchy, so they therefore received a training in what it was to be young members of the British royal family from him and his wife. Uh, he had great expectations for both of them. George VI was said to have called Elizabeth his pride and Margaret his joy. Much of Princess Elizabeth's lessons in life have been well taught by her father who prepared Elizabeth to be queen as soon as he was coronated. It's likely that this boost helped to inspire Elizabeth's well-known loyalty and devotion to the United Kingdom. The new king of the United Kingdom asked his eldest daughter Elizabeth to write an account of his coronation so that she would one day feel more prepared for her own. Elizabeth did as she was told, and she would write about her father in a very loving tone addressing him as her papa, and that he looked very beautiful on that day. It is reported that she saw a haze of wonder throughout Westminster Abbey as her father was crowned, according to Vanity Fair. The royal family split their time up between their house in London and one on the grounds of Windsor Great Park, where Elizabeth and her sister were privately tutored. Elizabeth was educated with the focus that she studied subjects that would bear significance for her future reign. These included European history, constitutional history, and laws, some of which were taught to her personally by Henry Martin, Vice Provost of Eton College. Religious lessons were taught to her by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Elizabeth was also taught both German and French, and became very well versed in the works of Shakespeare, Coleridge, Keats, Browning and Tennyson, among others. 
One of the things that really upset Margaret was that um, Elizabeth had lessons from the Provost of Eton. She was schooled in world events, history, the church, everything like that. And Margaret resented that because actually of the two of them, Margaret was the brighter. She was the intellectually brighter and more diligent and she longed to have a proper education. But in those days, that wasn't possible. You know, they had some rather mediocre tutors and governesses. So I think there's absolutely always a sense that whoever is heir apparent is being groomed for the role from the minute they know that that's their destiny. George had been preparing Elizabeth to one day succeed him as the British monarch and as head of Commonwealth. The way he'd done this is to, to essentially demonstrate to her uh, what the role of monarch required and also give her opportunities to, to de begin to develop uh, her own public role. And so there had always been a sense that he wants her to be surrounded by people like Alan Lassells, Tommy Lassells, who was his private secretary, who knew the basic workings of the monarchy, who could help her, who could guide her, because he remembered how Churchill had been an invaluable counsellor for him. And he knew that ultimately, if he wasn't able to be the person who could guide his daughter, he wanted people to be around her who could. And of course, one of these people was Winston Churchill. What tragedies? What horrors, what crimes has Hitler and all that Hitler stands for brought upon Europe and the world? In late August 1939, Hitler and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin signed the German-Soviet non-aggressive pact, which raised a concern in London and Paris. Hitler had long planned an attack on Poland a nation to which Great Britain and France guaranteed military support if it were attacked by Germany. On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland from the west. Two days later, France and Britain declared war on Germany, beginning World War II. The day that war was declared against Germany was a great moment of, of sadness and concern for the British public. They understood why this point had been reached, that Hitler had time and again broken promises, and as a result, Chamberlain and Chamberlain's government had been forced to declare war on Germany. In this moment of crisis, the British public, I think, were looking for, for leadership, not just from the government, but also from the British royal family. They were looking for reassurance that everything would be okay, and that the nation would get through this moment of peril. What George did is he was faced with enormous responsibility and with enormous difficulties. And it was essentially a case of sink or swim. What he was able to do was he was able to actually grasp the nettle. He was able to say, I have to be the king that Britain needs. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. Over and over again, we have tried to find a peaceful way out of the differences between ourselves and those who are now our enemies. In September 1940, shortly after the start of Germany's bombing campaign on the towns and cities of Britain, five high-explosive bombs were dropped on Buckingham Palace. The Royal Chapel, Inner Quadrangle and Palace Gates were hit, and several workmen were injured. Of the 500 German planes that came over that day, more than one-third were shot down. In the 28 days of terror from September 7th to October 5th, the Nazis dropped 50 million pounds of bombs on the city, killed 7,000 helpless civilians, and wounded 10,000 more. Bombs fell on Buckingham Palace. Westminster Abbey. The Houses of Parliament. Fleet Street, the center of the news. St. Paul's Cathedral. Bombs blasting the historic past out of the lives of Englishmen. After the palace was bombed, they're both absolutely terrified. The king wrote in his diary that he couldn't quite believe what had happened and that he was very, very lucky to have escaped. But days later, he's, he's still writing, I look outside, I can't forget seeing the bomb. 
I think that the king and queen saw the, the bombing of Buckingham Palace really as, a, as an important public relations opportunity, uh, using it to demonstrate that the royals were on the front line like their people, that they were suffering from the war along with the British public. Uh, cameramen, uh, journalists were invited into Buckingham Palace to survey the damage, to photograph it, and, and images emerged on the front, front page of newspapers of the king in amongst the rubble, in amongst the debris of Buckingham Palace. Uh, demonstrating that the king, he was also affected by what was going on. The royal couple visited areas of London which had been devastated by air raids, communicating with residents and members of the local emergency services. The queen took a keen interest in what was being done to help people who had lost their homes. Rather than flee the city under attack, King George VI and his wife, Queen Elizabeth, remained at Buckingham Palace in solidarity with those living through the raid. They shared the dangers and difficulties with the rest of the nation. This was highly symbolic and received much attention from the press. Of course, when World War II broke out and London was bombed and the royal family did not leave Buckingham Palace and everyone saw that the palace had been bombed and they went to visit the East End, that was incredibly clever and also incredibly soothing for the British public. So it stopped that them and us divide. Suddenly, uh, it's not them and us, it's they are one of us. And George grew into uh, his role as his popularity was cemented at this time. And the Queen famously declared, I'm glad we've been bombed because it makes me think I can look the East End in the face. There was a real sense of the traditional bounds coming down, a real sense that they were all in it together. The King and Queen were very keen to emphasize a narrative that they, the royals, and the British public at large were all in this war together, that there was a sense of shared sacrifice that united crown and people. Quickly, the king and queen's insistence on staying in Buckingham Palace, their strict adherence to rationing and other restrictions, and their compassionate visits to victims of the Blitz won over the population. This strengthened the monarchy. At the start of the war, there was a real concern at the palace that the British monarchy didn't really have a role to play. Then in the summer of 1940, as the, the bombing raids on London begin and the German Luftwaffe is blitzing uh, people's homes, factories and other towns and cities across the country, this, if you like, is the great opportunity for the British royal family because suddenly they have a role to play. They go out uh, visiting. Uh, members of the public who have been bombed out of their homes, who have been working through the night to, to help those who are suffering as a result of the air raids. They are there to, to provide reassurance to the public, to, to recognize the, the hard work and effort that is going in to fighting this war on the home front. So it was a, it's a different kind of leadership to the, to the wars of before, in that George and his wife Elizabeth's roles were much more focused on Britain and the home front. Prince Philip and Princess Elizabeth found love during the war. Because of her royal background and the way she was brought up, Elizabeth was very mature for a 13-year-old girl. She wasn't at all swayed being in the presence of a man who was five years older than her. While no royal weddings occurred in England during World War II, the seeds of a romance were sprouting. At the age of 13, just a few months before the war, Princess Elizabeth became infatuated with a naval cadet who gave her family a tour of the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth, and they began exchanging letters in July 1939. They exchanged letters throughout the Second World War. Princess Elizabeth met Prince Philip at a family wedding, but she can't really remember that moment, so the reason that we know so much about it is because her governess, Marion Crawford, uh, talks in great detail about their first meeting at Dartmouth College, where Prince Philip was a, a naval cadet. 
and he was very, very good looking, 18 years old, very striking, blonde looking. And he was assigned to look after the two princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, for the day, for their visit, while their parents went around the college. It's quite strange to think of an 18-year-old looking after the princesses, the oldest of whom was 13. But he decided that it would be fun if they jumped the tennis nets. And so he took the princesses outside and he jumped the tennis nets for them and they were very very impressed later he went on board the vessel that the, the, the king and queen had come to dartmouth in and he had lunch and then and the following day he went and had tea so that was the meeting that the princess remembers philip served with distinction in the royal navy during the war he was assigned to the battleship HMS Valiant in the Mediterranean. There, he participated in the Battle of Cape Matapan on the 28th of March, 1941, and earned a commendation for his command of a searchlight crew. After a return to Britain for more courses, he served on the destroyer HMS Wallace, escorting convoys on Britain's east coast and participating in the invasion of Sicily in 1943. In 1942, he became the first lieutenant of the Wallace, one of the youngest men to hold that rank, and in 1944, Prince Philip became first lieutenant of the brand new HMS Welp, which served in the Indian Ocean. It is no shock that Princess Elizabeth saw a devoted and dedicated man in Philip all throughout the war. Like many children living in London, Elizabeth and her sister Margaret were evacuated to avoid the dangers of bombing raids. Schoolrooms blasted into destruction, helpless children trapped by exploding death. To prevent such things this time, to prevent the slaughter of the innocents, thousands of youngsters are removed to safe havens in the countryside. They're happy now. It's all a game to them. But who knows? They know not the horrors of war that already have been unleashed. In 1940, Hitler began to bomb England. Thousands of children were evacuated, among them Elizabeth and Margaret, now 14 and 10, who were sent up the Thames to a safer haven. There appeared to be circulation in which the daughters should evacuate to North America or Canada. The Queen disapproved and made her famous reply, The children won't go without me. I won't leave the king, and the king will never leave. Well, the outbreak of, of World War II affected the British royal family hugely because um, they were right up there at Buckingham Palace, which was a big, big target for the German bombers. But they decided that they would not leave the country, they would stay there with their people, but they obviously had to look after their two daughters. Elizabeth and Margaret started in Scotland, then they were uh, sent down south and they eventually stayed at Windsor Castle for five years while well, the king and queen went to London during the week. They wanted to be visible to their people so they would go round the bombed areas you know and meet the people and obviously the king became very involved with the troops and he would go and visit the troops. So they were a very big part of the sort of PR war effort. The sisters spent most of their war years at Windsor Castle, and like many other children, they were away from their parents. The young princesses were two of over three million people, mainly children, who left cities for the safety of small towns and the countryside over the course of the war. The young princesses also had an important public relations role to play during the Second World War. Their whereabouts were kept hidden, mainly out of concern for their safety. And it was initially rumored that they might be taken to Canada to be put out of harm's way. But instead, uh, there was great emphasis placed publicly on the fact that they remained in Britain, but were separated from their parents so that they, if you like, symbolized the experience of evacuation, separation from their parents, members of their family. 
Uh, in that respect, they were upheld as symbols of the war experience, uh, symbolic of their generation. In fact, we know now that they spent most of the war at Windsor Castle. Most evenings they were reunited with their mother and father who returned there. But in terms of the public narrative, in terms of what ordinary people read uh, and knew about, uh, they were separated from their family. On October the 13th, 1940, when she was only 14, Elizabeth gave a radio broadcast from the drawing room of Windsor Castle as part of the BBC's Children's Hour in an attempt to boost public morale as people had been evacuated from their homes due to World War II. Five famous little hearts are stirred as the Dion Quince listened to a broadcast from London by Princess Elizabeth, a message of cheer to children of the Empire. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. Princess Margaret adds her farewell to the broadcast in the end. She spoke directly to the children who had been separated from their families as part of the evacuation scheme. As the war progressed, Princess Elizabeth championed more aspects of wartime life and resilience. They asked the king if he would consider allowing his daughter to do it. Well, of course, she was thrilled to do it and practiced very, very hard. And eventually, age, age only 14, gave this extremely professional speech to the children that were separated from their parents. She would talk uh, on the topic of evacuation. In what was meant to be a, a broadcast directed towards evacuated children uh, who were now living in North America, uh, she talked about how she and her sister could empathize with them because they knew what it was to be separated from their parents. What she was referring to there was not only the fact that she was meant to be uh, living away from the King and Queen, but also the fact that through the late 1930s, uh, King George and Queen Elizabeth had spent time away from uh, Britain uh, on royal tours abroad and of course had left their children behind. So this was a, a message designed to empathise uh, with evacuated children. It was also an opportunity for the British monarchy to once again say, we're all in this together. We're sharing in the hardships and the sacrifices of the war. It was very, very professionally done. And then Princess Elizabeth, always thinking about her younger sister, she brought her younger sister in at the very end and said, come on, Margaret. And come on, Margaret became a catchphrase in America. The, 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 the speech went down an absolute storm in America. And um, it was like headline news in the New York Post, you know, that, the, the, that this princess had given this speech to the evacuees. During the war, King George VI started assigning some royal responsibilities to Elizabeth. Elizabeth joined the military and they were girl guides and in fact apparently Margaret was a very good girl guide and was much more practical than her sister and loved a lot of the exercises that they had to do and I think that they genuinely wanted to be like all the other children and to be treated obviously they were never going to be treated the same but they were experiencing uh, similar events going on and that's very unifying for the country. Reviewing the girl guides at Windsor Castle, the little princesses Elizabeth, 12, and Margaret, 8, assumed new importance. But war or not, Elizabeth had her duties. She celebrated her 16th birthday with the review of the famed Grenadier Guards. In 1942, George made Elizabeth an honorary colonel in the Royal Army's 500 Grenadier Guards. In 1943, Elizabeth was photographed contributing to her allotments at Windsor Castle as part of the government's Dig for Victory campaign, in which people were urged to use gardens and every spare piece of land to grow vegetables to help combat food shortages. Before the Second World War, Britain relied on food imports across the world. But when the war started, the shipping was threatened by enemy submarines and warships. This resulted in food shortages and led to less delivery of foods, such as meat, butter, cheese, eggs, and sugar. The ultimate sign of his trust, however, 
was the responsibility King George VI granted Elizabeth when she turned 18. While he was away on the Italian battlefields, she was named a Councillor of State, which allowed her to represent the UK when her father was abroad and unable to do so. For several years during the war, Britain had enforced women to join the war effort. Unmarried women under 30 had to join the armed forces or work on the land or in industry. When Princess Elizabeth turned 18 in 1944, she joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service, ATS, the women's branch of the British Army. And it was very interesting both for her on a personal level, but also from a propaganda level, that the King's heir was somebody who was actually doing things, she was being seen as having practical tasks and so on. And it was, very, I think, very important for the royal family that they were all seen as doing something, doing their bit. Princess in overalls. On her 19th birthday, the heiress presumptive to England's throne learns a few facts about tires and carburetors. Elizabeth is in the ATS, or British WAC, and at the king's request, is being treated just like any other trainee. Now visited by her parents and sister Margaret Rose at a training station in southern England, she shows them she knows a fan belt from a spark plug, all right, and isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Her father gave her an officer's commission early in March. Papa and Mama seem to approve, too. Daughter is the first woman member of the royal family to join the services full time. The young princess, who's never set foot in a London bus and was only once in the subway, now drives a truck for the Red Cross. And, come to think of it, can you name a better way for a princess to spend her birthday? King George VI made sure that his daughter was not given a special rank in the army. She started as a second subaltern in the ATS and was later promoted to junior commander, the equivalent of captain. Elizabeth joined the ATS, which saw her embark on military service for the first time. Uh, she was there essentially as a mechanic, an army mechanic. The press uh, and newsreel images that we uh, see of her from this period show her driving around in, in army lorries, uh, looking at uh, and inspecting engines. The emphasis clearly here was again on the, the princess doing her bit, demonstrating that, like other women of her age, she was ready uh, to do her service uh, in order to ensure that the war was won. There were a range of jobs available to female soldiers in the ATS, as cooks, telephonists, drivers, postal workers, searchlight operators and ammunition inspectors. Some women served as part of anti-aircraft units, although they were not allowed to fire the guns. The jobs were extremely dangerous, and during the war, 335 ATS women were killed and many more injured. By June 1945, there were around 200,000 members of the ATS from across the British Empire serving on the home front and in many overseas theatres of war. Princess Elizabeth began her training as a mechanic in March 1945. She took a driving and vehicle maintenance course in Aldershot, qualifying on April the 14th. Both of her parents were extremely pleased with their daughter. While Princess Elizabeth spent the majority of her days at the training facility, it was close enough to Windsor Castle that the princess would return there each evening rather than sleep with her fellow ATS members. Elizabeth's family visited Princess Elizabeth at the mechanical transport training section in Surrey and watched her learn about engine maintenance. It is said that Margaret was somewhat annoyed at Elizabeth's special treatment during World War II because she did not understand why her older sister, Princess Elizabeth, was able to join the services, but she could not. Due to the five-year age gap between the sisters, Margaret was not able to join the war effort herself. When they were children, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, of course, they had, uh, apparently Princess Margaret had a pretty good left hook. Margaret understood his temperament. Margaret was terribly spoiled. I mean, she was a complete daddy's girl. 
but she was the only one who could soothe him when he got into what the family called one of his terrible gnashes, his kind of anxious, frustrated rages. And Margaret uh, would be the one who could you sort of tickle him out of those with humour and love and jokes. Princess Elizabeth would, would sometimes complain, Margaret always wants what I want. So I think what you actually see there between the two of them is sibling rivalry, as, as there would be with other children, other sisters, other brothers. It's something that one always has to remember. They may have been princesses, they may have been royal, but they were also human. This was, this was the, the tone of their lives, that they were very, very close. But of course there were kind of moments where they would kick and, and they would bite and they would fight, you know, or particularly Princess Margaret would. He always gave Margaret an extra kiss. I think the whole feeling was that Elizabeth was going to be queen, that she was going to have everything. So there had to be so much attention and focus on Margaret, who was overindulged, whereas Elizabeth was so much was expected of her. And because she was that sort of character that took her duty so seriously, in, in many ways, she was sort of almost left to get on with the job. And all this attention went to Margaret, who became the black sheep of the family, uh, but was utterly adored by her father. I don't think Princess Margaret consciously lived her life thinking of the differences between her and her sister. But there, it has been said that she was jealous of her sister. Well, I always counter that by saying, given how close they were always throughout their life, even if it was just to say hello, they talk on the telephone every day. It's very difficult to maintain that close bond as well as being jealous of somebody. When their uncle, David, as he was known to the family, otherwise King Edward VIII, abdicated, it was Princess Elizabeth who told Princess Margaret, and she said, Uncle David's going away and Papa is to be king. And Princess Margaret said to her, does that mean you're going to be queen? And Elizabeth said, yes, one day. And nothing more was ever said about it or between them. And Princess Elizabeth, as, as we know very well, is able to compartmentalize aspects of her life. At the time of their parents' coronation in May of 1937, Margaret was a bit bothered by the fact that her train was shorter than her sister's, and she complained about this, and it had to be explained to her that it had nothing to do with rank. She wasn't being demoted in any way. What it meant was that the train was cut in relation to their height. So as Margaret was shorter, she obviously had a shorter train. So there was just that kind of little thing. Why, well, why doesn't that also apply to me? As she grew up, of course, she knew, knew perfectly well why there would be those kind of certain differences. However, Margaret did reap some benefits from her sister's role as a mechanic in that Elizabeth had taught her sister to drive. She did rely on her sister very much, and Elizabeth's role in the services during the war did leave Margaret feeling very proud. Elizabeth looked after her. She was always really kind to her little sister, her beautiful little sister. And they had a very, very close relationship. They looked after each other, but obviously Elizabeth was the oldest. And so she kind of took charge of her little sister. Because there was this incredibly strong, loving bond between Princess Margaret and Princess Elizabeth, that there was always that support there throughout their lives. They were as different as chalk and cheese. Princess Elizabeth, very uncomplicated, very straightforward. Princess Margaret, very complex. You know, her sister uh, in later life described her as being an enigma. And really, that about sums her up because she was a very enigmatic personality.
Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister in office at the time of World War II. Like many people of the era, Princess Elizabeth had grown up regarding Churchill as a hero who had saved the nation from Hitler and the Nazi military machine. When World War II erupted, the general feeling in the government was to try and negotiate a peace settlement. However, Churchill expressed doubts about negotiating with Adolf Hitler and felt the only option was to battle on. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall go on fighting, breaking their black hearts. He went on to lead Britain to victory in the long and hard-fought war, which finally ended on the 2nd of September, 1945. When Churchill became Prime Minister, there was a real sense that Churchill was ungovernable. He would not listen to the king. He would tell the king what was going to happen. He was saying, I, I cannot regard Winston as being my prime minister. I regard this as something that I can't get used to. But what happened over the course of World War II was that this relationship sprung up between them, which went from being, I think, mutual animosity to, first of all, a kind of grudging respect, and then later a friendship. The king wanted to be present off the coast of Normandy for the D-Day invasion, which would see Britain and its, uh, its allies from the empire in America uh, invade France in order to liberate it from Nazi occupation. Now, Churchill warned the king that he must not be there, that it was too serious a matter for the king to be off the coast of Normandy should he be targeted by a, by a, a German aircraft. But Churchill insisted that he had to be there off the coast of Normandy and present on the day. Now, the king couldn't have that. He couldn't have his prime minister there and not be there himself. Eventually, the two men agreed that neither would be present, and the D-Day landings went ahead without king or prime minister off the coast of Normandy. His generals were cold-bloodedly picking out the first victim, Norway. And why did they pick Norway? Its many steep inlets or fjords would make excellent U-boat bases from which raiders could prey on British supply lines. Also, it would give the Nazis vital air bases. This is Scapa Flow, British naval base, and this the blockade fleet. At this time, the German base bombers couldn't reach them. Possession of bases on Norway's western shore would bring these vital British defenses under easy bomber attack. But he couldn't take Norway without also taking tiny Denmark, the springboard for his attack. The young Elizabeth knew him as the charismatic leader she had heard so many times on the radio. She was 19 when the war ended, and Churchill had become an icon to the British public thanks to his leadership skills. Winston Churchill played a massive role in the way that the future Queen of Britain would reign. Churchill was credited with making inspirational speeches that ensured not only the government, but the whole nation were behind him. It is upon this foundation that Hitler pretends to build out of hatred a new order for Europe. But nothing is more certain than that every trace of Hitler's footsteps, every stain of his infected and corroding fingers will be sponged and purged and, if need be, blasted from the surface of the earth. Lift up your hearts. All will come right out of the depths of sorrow and of sacrifice. Will be born again the glory of mankind. The young Elizabeth was highly influenced by Churchill and followed exactly in his footsteps, leading the nation as one. Throughout most of the, the conflict, the king and the, and the king's private secretary were really concerned that the prime minister, with his, his, his charisma and his bombastic persona, was really outshining the monarch uh, and, and had become, if you like, the central focus of the war effort. And George VI really felt overshadowed. You know, earlier on in his life, he'd been overshadowed by his eldest brother. Now he's being overshadowed 
uh, by his prime minister. And so there was a real emphasis on trying to, to build up the king's public image. In fact, it was during the, the conflict that the king recruited a cameraman into Buckingham Palace to follow his every activity. So every time he went out publicly, he had this cameraman with him taking film, uh, which would then be given out to the newsreels for distribution uh, to demonstrate that the king was this very active figure in the war effort. When the Conservative government was, was replaced by Attlee and the Labour government, George VI was absolutely horrified by it, and he would essentially say, how can the British people be so ungrateful? And it had to be explained to him that Churchill was not Prime Minister for life, that the electorate were allowed to choose another Prime Minister, but he couldn't ever get his head around it. And so, in fact, for the rest of his life, he would treat Attlee as a kind of substitute, and Churchill was one that he still asked for advice and still wanted to be in contact with. I know you will not expect me to say that I look forward to an occasion when your services will be required. But should it ever arise, I am certain that we can destroy any enemy who comes into our midst. And that in itself is an additional deterrent against an attempt to attack this famous and long inviolate island. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Uh, hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. Unconditional surrender, victory over our last enemy, Japan. May the 8th, 1945 was the date the Allies celebrated the defeat of the Nazi Germany and the end of Adolf Hitler's Reich. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Recognizing the end of the Second World War. Victory in Europe Day. Tomorrow will also be Victory in Europe Day. He has inflicted upon Great Britain, the United States and other countries and her detestable cruelties call for justice and retribution. We must now devote all our strength and resources to the completion of our tasks, both at home and abroad. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the King. It had been five long years since war broke out, and the nation was gearing up for a celebration like no other. King George VI made a radio broadcast to the people of the Commonwealth to mark the end of the war. We give thanks to God for a great deliverance. The Germany, the enemy who drove all Europe into war, has been finally overcome. The King spoke about the sacrifice that ordinary members of the public had made, that that sacrifice had been, been worth it, in that the war had been won, fascism had been beaten, and that democracy would now prevail. In London, thousands of people took to the streets to celebrate, flooding Trafalgar Square and the Mall leading up to Buckingham Palace, where the King and Queen greeted them from the balcony on one occasion with Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Princess Elizabeth wore the uniform of the Auxiliary Territorial Service. The celebrations for VE Day were long in the planning. For literally months, uh, the British government had been corresponding with the palace, thinking about and working out how they were gonna stage this moment of celebration. The day itself 
unfolded as a day of, of, of great jubilation, of great relief. The centerpiece of the day in terms of royal photography was the, the moment when Winston Churchill, as, if you like, successful war leader and prime minister, joined the royal war leader, George VI and George VI's family, on the palace balcony to be cheered by the crowds that gathered below. The young princesses insisted on leaving their house in the evening to join the festivals outside. There was naturally some resistance concerning the safety of their children. However, as long as they were accompanied, this was approved by the king and queen. Princess Elizabeth spoke to the BBC about how she tried to avoid being spotted. There are even reports that the princesses joined a conga dance through the Ritz Hotel as they celebrated with the crowds. Princess Elizabeth is to have said that it was one of the most memorable nights of her life. I remember the thrill and relief after the previous day's waiting for the Prime Minister's announcement of the end of the war in Europe. And my parents went out on the balcony in response to the huge crowds outside. I think we went on the balcony nearly every hour, six times. My sister and I realized we couldn't see what the crowds were enjoying. My mother had put her tiara on for the occasion, so we asked my parents if we could go out and see for ourselves. I remember we were terrified of being recognized, so I pulled my uniform cap well down over my eyes. After crossing Green Park, we stood outside and shouted, we want the king and we were successful in seeing my parents on the balcony. Having cheated slightly because we sent a message into the house to say we were waiting outside. I think it was one of the most memorable nights of my life. Without a doubt, the indomitable spirit of the royal family helped the people of the United Kingdom through their darkest times. World War II set a tone for the monarchy going forward. King George VI died in 1952, just seven years after the end of World War II. George VI, who had, as a young man, often suffered from ill health, became quite ill as a result of the, the Second World War. The stress of the conflict told on him he was a heavy smoker, uh, and by 1945, his health was actually very poor. In the ensuing years, that health would deteriorate. A number of smoking-related diseases uh, would afflict the king uh, to the extent where he would ultimately die prematurely in 1952. I think that the legacy of King George is so strong precisely because it's contrasted against the legacy of his brother. So Edward is seen as somebody who jettisoned the throne of England. George is seen as somebody who didn't want it, who sat on it, and did his very best on it and brought great stability to the country and also had this secure, tight family. Elizabeth was taught from such a young age what a monarch should be about. She put in the forthright dedication just as much as her father did and is now known to have become the longest reigning monarch in British history. I think that if King George's spirit had been watching for Platinum Jubilee celebrations, he would have looked at it, he would have found some of it quite surprising, some of it rather strange. But I think generally, first of all, he would have enjoyed them. Secondly, he would have looked at his daughter and what she's achieved in the last 70 years, and he would have thought, I'm very glad to see what she's done. <laughs>